As you mentioned that uh, yoga improves the performance of body mind complex and there are certain techniques and guidance required to achieve this. Can you briefly uh, tell us that what are these techniques or guidance that one has to keep it in mind to improve the performance of body mind because it's already complex and we believe that it is a union of mind and body that makes uh, the yoga perfect. So, what are these uh, techniques and uh, guidance that one has to follow? Briefly, sir, if you can mention that. No, let's divide it into two parts, the techniques for improving the performance of the body and the mind and the second part that is the guidance for how to use the body-mind complex. So far as the techniques are concerned, and the techniques primarily for the body are the asanas, the postures and for the mind, meditation. A pranayama acts as a sort of a bridge between the body and the mind and uh, all these three put together would improve the performance of the body and the mind. Now one might say that uh, why do we need to do these postures? One can improve the performance of the body also by other means like uh, walking, jogging, swimming, cycling or playing hockey or football. Uh, how do these uh, practices differ? Are they just because, uh, is it just because uh, they involve a different type of movement or are they in any way really better? There is enough of uh, scientific evidence to show that in fact they are far better than these other more ordinary ways of improving the performance of the body. And uh, one can explain that because of several, uh, and there, one can explain that there are several factors that contribute to it. Firstly, these uh, practices are very comprehensive. They involve a workout from top to toe, whereas uh, some of the other practices like say jogging would involve mainly the exercise of the legs. Secondly, these are uh, designed in such a way that uh, the stretch alternates with relaxation. And uh, you know, we start with a relaxed position. From there, slowly we go to a final position, which is a position of intense but enjoyable stretch. And then from there, we come back once again to a relaxed position. And the result is that uh, the focus remains on relaxation and uh, on improving the flexibility of the body. And these are something which, this is something which is basic. If we straight away go to jerky, rapid movements, the way one would say if one starts running, uh, that increases the chance of injury. Or if one tries to focus on increasing the strength of the muscles as in weight lifting, that can also cause an injury. So these exercises, these postures, yogic postures, should be preliminary even to going for uh, any of the other things if one wants to say train for competitive sports, in, uh, for jogging or for weight lifting, even that person would benefit by first starting to learn how to relax the muscles and uh, to improve the flexibility of the body. Then another thing that contributes to it is that the sequence of these postures is so arranged that every pose is followed by its, its counter pose. So that uh, the stretch generated by one posture gets neutralized in the next posture. And then there is a lot of relaxation built in, interspersed between the postures. And uh, the session ends also usually with uh, a pretty long relaxation in Shavasana. This along with the fact that uh, the whole session is conducted in a peaceful atmosphere, it starts with a prayer, it ends with a prayer, the voice of the instructor is soothing, all these things contribute to these practices becoming much more relaxing than one can imagine any physical practice to be. So as a result, at the end of the session, this person is not really exhausted. In fact, the person is very relaxed and rejuvenated. Now, when it comes to pranayamas, that is uh, the breathing practices. In fact, uh, pranayama means control of prana or the life force. And uh, breathing happens to be the most visible manifestation of that life force. And in terms of uh, the traditional way of uh, looking at the uh, different parts of the being, the body is what we call the anamaya kosha and uh, the mind is the manamaya kosha. Pranamaya kosha or the life force comes in between. And uh, therefore these practices which uh, regulate the prana, which we try to achieve to some extent by regulating the pattern of breathing, uh, 
they act as a sort of a bridge between the body and the mind and improve to some extent the performance of both. Now then the meditative techniques which uh, focus on the improving the performance of the mind. The basic principle of meditation is that uh, the very nature of the mind is uh, rather such that uh, it tends to be chaotic. We have thousands of thoughts coming and going uh, all the time. And uh, so long as this uh, surface activity of the mind remains chaotic, one cannot really look deep within. And, uh, and therefore, all meditative techniques essentially try to achieve uh, some degree of silencing of this surface activity so that uh, the person can look deeper within and uh, those parts of the consciousness which are normally not accessible to us because of this surface noise become more accessible. And this is easy to understand. For example, if uh, one wants to look at the bottom of the swimming pool, that's possible only if the surface is quiet. And to make the surface quiet, we don't really have to do anything very active. We have to just let it be. And to some extent, that's what we do in the meditative techniques also. We try and uh, adopt that passive attitude so that uh, the mind tends to settle down. And then after that, there are broadly speaking two types of methods that are used and sometimes the two can be also combined. One is the concentration type of meditation in which uh, you try and achieve a certain silence, but then to leave a vacuum is uh, difficult because nature abhors vacuum. So if uh, we have a total silence, then again some stray thoughts would come and invade the mind. So what we try and do in concentration is engage the mind once again, but in something which is non-analytic, simple, repetitive and mechanical in nature. So that the mind is occupied and yet it is not involved in any complex thoughts. It's not involved in thoughts which would uh, distract the person from looking deeper. And uh, usually the concentration is on a sound, a sound which is not just a neutral sound, but a sound that signifies the sacred to the person, a sound for which the person has a certain respect, a sound with which the person has a certain emotional attachment. Now, by doing that, the person is able to engage himself totally because uh, at the level of the body and the bridge between the body and the mind, that is the breath, the person is focusing on the breath, trying to make, make the breathing slow and conscious. And then he synchronizes this with the sound that he's repeating mechanically and the sound in which he's emotionally involved. And uh, the result is that uh, now the person is uh, not distracted and at the same time, his mind is not a vacuum and therefore he can look deeper within. In the mindfulness type of techniques, uh, what one does is to go through a series of stages. First one just tries to let the thoughts pass without trying to get interested in them, without getting involved in them. So we let the thoughts run through the mind. Then the next stage would be to try and uh, take interest in them, but only to the extent of trying to classify them into thoughts which are worth retaining and those which are not. And then the next step would be to filter these thoughts, retain only those which are worth retaining. And the last step, which can be a long way off, would be a total mastery over the thoughts so that only those thoughts uh, come to the mind which are worth retaining. One can combine the two as happens in Patanjali's scheme where dhyana is the stage of concentration, uh, sorry, one can combine the two as happens in Patanjali's scheme where dharana is the stage of concentration and dhyana is the stage of contemplation or mindfulness.